There we go. Hey. I should have recorded myself. Um, hey, everyone. <laughs> good morning. Good evening to wherever you are. Welcome to the Chaos Data Science Working Group. Uh, today's December 3rd. Uh, we do have a new link to our um, meeting notes. So if you go to the old one, there should be a huge disclaimer at the top of that to click on our new notes. Um, and that has also been pasted into the chat. Um, we have a really good question for today, and that is, uh, what is your favorite holiday, which is, it could be any holiday uh, food item that you, that you enjoy. I think I will uh, share my screen. There is also plenty of room for any agenda items that you'd like to, uh, sh that you'd like to discuss today. Yes, apple cranberry crumble sounds good too. <laughs> I'm going to Munich this weekend, so so that's why I'm all about the Christmas glue vine. Oh, the Christmas market in Munich is, I hear, very good. It is. Yeah, we went a few years ago. My partner's there this week for work, so I we just tacked on a weekend. I'm going to go join him. Perfect. It's exactly the way to travel. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, sticky rice cake sounds good. <laughs> Mine is entirely NFC North based in the National Football League in the United States. So do you eat the Lions no. by the Bears? No, it's just, these are just teams. The holiday is just, they, they mean division games against the three other teams in the Packers division. So that is, that is the nature of holidays in my house or my brain at least. We actually have some um, uh, new folks joining us. Um, you're welcome to introduce yourselves here if you'd like, and if not, that's totally fine too. I'll quickly hop in. Hi, uh, I know some of you. I don't know others of you. My name's Ava. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. I met uh, Don for the first time at I don't even remember what it's called. What was the conference? <laughs> Open uh, Forum Academy. That right, that one. Uh, I think I also met Sophia there very briefly as well. Uh, and then Sean, I, I've known Sean for, I don't know, a, a year or so. I don't know how long Sean, well, but. <laughs> somewhere between one and two years, I think. I Maybe like a year and a half. Maybe it was summer Something of 2020. Something like that. It was 2023, I want to say like May. So let's say a year and a half. Um, but yeah, I, I do research on uh, mainly scientific software, not just gen not general open source software, but scientific. So, yeah. Yeah, welcome. Eva. Cool cat in the background. <laughs> Cat's like aware that it was referenced. It moved its head. And is it so sad? I saw you came off mute. You're welcome to introduce yourself, but no pressure as well. We can um, go into the next items. Oh, uh, it's fine. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tosan, and um, I'm from the Chaos Africa Researchers Group. I, um, I, I, I met Dawn on chat once, and she invited me to the meeting, and I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to the group. All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started for our meeting. And thank you to whoever's sharing. I was just trying to share and I couldn't, uh, for some reason, it didn't let me. Um, so our first agenda item is about a relicensing and forks project. Dawn actually uh, kicked off this project and there are some uh, links to it that I can share here as well to, um, to what the project is. There's a full README as well as um, some uh, how to get involved and some issues that you can um, pull if you're interested in contributing to it. 
But in the uh, past year, there were several, in the past few years, there were several open source projects that were relicensed. And because of that relicensing, um, the community did hard forks on those projects and created uh, new, uh, new projects of their own uh, to continue some of that work. And so uh, Dawn recently um, worked on a paper for this and presented it at OFA. And Dawn, I don't know if you had a chance to tell us more about um, the outcome of it, but would you like to share some insights on that conference and if you got any feedback? Yeah, sure. Um, so I did I did present the work that we've done so far on the forks and relicensing, which has been entirely focused on organizational affiliation. So looking at what companies, people who are contributing both to the project that was relicensed and to the fork that resulted. And so we um, right now we focused on three case studies. So Elasticsearch and the open search fork, uh, Terraform and the open tofu fork and uh, Redis and the Valky fork. So those are the three projects that we focused on. And I thought the presentation at, at OFA went really well. I got really good, I got really good feedback on it. People seemed, uh, people seemed to like it. Um, and people also seemed to be excited to see what, uh, what happened next, right? So like I said, this is entirely focused on just the companies that these people worked for. Um, which you kind of have to start there when you're looking, especially at something something like this. Um, but then the idea is that we take this and then we start looking at other aspects of Project Health, which I was super excited to see uh, Chan working on. So maybe maybe at this point, I just kick it over to you and you can talk more about the, the work that you've done. Yeah, so I, um, I took... Um some visualizations from 8Knot, and I can share the link to 8Knot here. Um, but I basically went into 8Knot, um, put, put in each of the repos for those, for those um, six projects. So it's three comparisons, but two, uh, two projects for each comparison. So Open Tofu versus Terraform, Valky versus Redis, and then Elasticsearch versus OpenSearch. Um, and I, I just punched it into 8Knot and that created all of the vis visualizations for me. I actually didn't have to do very much, um, but I took each of the visualizations and compared them within each project. And I can show that here, just give me a second to pull it up. So I'll start with. Um, I think I can. If you are, aren't weren't able to share, I think I could. Uh, I tried to just make you co-host. If you want to share, okay. Chan. I'll try again. So let me try again. Um, Uh, it wants me to restart my entire Zoom. Okay. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. Do you, want me to, um, do you want me to click a link that you, you have in yeah, the let documents? Me, let me sorry about that. Just, let me yeah, I just dropped all of the links to the presentations that you posted in oh, cool. uh, Slack. Thank you. So awesome. you touch on which, which one you need, he can click on it. So I guess you probably just want all of them in sequence, right? I, I think we could just look at one of them just to check out one, uh, kind of give okay. you guys the gist of what that looks like. You should be able to open the link in your browser. You should be yeah, able to. Yeah, my, my, my browser is like redirecting me to Slack, which is weird. Yeah, but no, if you click, click, it says you can open this link in your browser. You should be able uh, to click. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> well, we'll see if I can. Uh, now it's taking me to a Slack. Yeah, this is, oops, this is taking, uh, hold on, sorry, folks, my ability to manage yeah, you know what? I've got them. I've got them all downloaded. Do you all want right. me? Yeah, why don't you go ahead, because if you're ready yeah. to go, I'll let, yeah, why don't you go? Sorry about that, folks. Technology is hard. 
Oh, it says only one participant can share at a time right now. But, oh, um, instead of one. Sorry, never mind. Okay. Whoops. I am I. I see your screen. Okay. Not sure exactly what I shared, but um, so we're seeing slide two. Okay, yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, I put the link to um, Eight Nod in the chat, and anyone here is welcome to go to it. Um, it's it's open publicly, and um, Callie, um, who she's not on this call today, but she usually joins. Oh, she is. Meetings. She's here. Oh, is she here? Hey, Callie. Yeah. Um, she uh, she has she's been the one who has driven a lot of the work for Eight Knot and helped to build it. And so, um, thank you, Callie, for creating this and making it so easy for us to look at um, open source health and pulling. Th this was super super easy. All I had to do was put in the repo, click searched, and all of these visualizations came up. Um, so thank you for your work on this. Um, so in these PowerPoints are just comparisons between each of the projects. Elasticsearch is the um, project that was um, originally open, open source and then um, was when they went to change their license, uh, it moved, I think in 2021, um, the community moved to open search. And so here are just the comparisons. I believe if you look, Don, do you, could you go up one um, to slide four? I think you can notice here, it's a little bit hard to see, but um, this is the open SSF scorecard for each of these projects. And you'll see that for Elasticsearch, their total aggregate score was five, um, but now their score is a little bit higher, which is a 5.7. And I think for all of the projects, their security actually went up in score, um, which, which means that they're, they're a little bit more secure in what they're doing. Um, now, I don't know the entire scorecard and all the ins and outs and intricacies of what makes the scorecard uh, what it is. Um, so there could be some other factors that um, are in that that People, that people who know these projects really well can, can speak to. Um, but just based on the, that score, it seems that these projects have, have increased a little bit in their security. Meaning that the fork has better security than the original project. Right. Yes. Um, other things, I think the other thing that I noted in these was that, um, let's see, I posted it up. Um, that they, there were stale PRs before the license fork. So in Elastic, here's the slide. Thank you, Dawn. Um, in Elastic, you'll see that uh, there were a lot of stale PRs um, throughout from 2020 onwards and upwards of 800 stale PRs. Um, and then when it was forked, this one, it's a little bit hard to do a one-to-one -one comparison because of the um, be, because of the timelines of these, but um, you'll see that there are, are fewer stale PRs in the uh, then forked project. And that's I was I think that's the case for all three of the comparisons that we're looking at. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does so when I, and I don't remember what happens, but when you create a fork of an existing project, does that bring the existing PRs with, with it in that fork? I the answer to that question, know. whatever the answer to that question is, would affect what this graph looks like um, at, a, at a high level, though it looks like it does at least bring the closed ones. And it looks like it might bring them all, but the, the scale on open search is, of course, much smaller, which makes makes it a little bit less clear what the answer to that question might be. Sophia. I don't, I don't want to interrupt. I don't have the answer to Sean. I have another thought. So if you want to comment on his question first. 
I don't know the answer, but I'll look it up now. Um, yeah, I can't remember. I mean, I think I think if any of us look at a forked repository that we've forked from something else to contribute back to it, um, yeah. if we look at our, I can't do it right now because I'm on, I'm sharing. Well, I guess I could do it in another window. Um, but yeah, I don't remember if it brings the forks with it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I you obviously don't, I don't either. <laughs> would, because the forks are under your personal repo. So if you're only looking at the forks under, like under Elasticsearch or the PR under Elasticsearch, it shouldn't show the personal fork. At least that's how I assume yeah. the event stream is working. Right, but what about the pull request, I think? Well, there's the pull request event that creates the uh, fork. The oh, right, repo. That's, that's true, okay. And then when you go back and submit it again, then that's another event on the pull request. Okay, okay. So, but it, it should have the same ID, so it should create a new one depending on how you're counting that. <clears throat> so I just looked at the open search um, PR history, and the first, the oldest PR is from 2021, which is when they forked. So it doesn't seem like it is bringing over anything that was in Elasticsearch, which would have started in, what, 2013, 2012? Okay. Yeah, I just looked at one of my forks and it doesn't seem to bring over any of the pull requests, even the even the completed ones when you fork a project. So I don't think the pull requests come over, the commits do. Yeah, and I think that's um, aligned with what the graph is saying here because the open search graph starts at 2021. Which actually makes it easier for us from a comparison standpoint um, to not have that that old data because one of the one of the challenges with um, with looking at forks is that because because they forked the original project, um, you see all of the history from that original project. Um, so, like if you look at data before the time before the date of the fork. You'll see commits. You'll see you'll see stuff going on that didn't actually happen in the fork. It happened in the original project. It was something that that tripped people up when we looked at because uh, when I worked at Pivotal, we had a product called Green Plum, which was a fork of Postgres. And so people would be would look at the data for this project and be like, Oh my God, what happened? There used to be so much activity, and it was like, No, all of that activity was Postgres. Um, and you can only look at the Green Plum data from from this date forward. So it's 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 kind of interesting from a from a data standpoint. Uh, Sophia, you you had a comment, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just sort of thinking about this in comparison to your work, Don, um, and just wondering if we could look at the affiliations of the stale PRs, um, knowing the distributions that you shared of predominantly employee-based work. Like, are these are these the employees or is these the others? <laughs> And that also might give an indication of behavior. Yeah, that would be really interesting. And we could, um, yeah, we could certainly certainly look at that because I have, I have the affiliation data in um, Python pickle files. They're stored in like dictionaries and data frames and things. So we could we could basically match up some of that data. We wouldn't be able to do it through uh, eight knot because that's more of a visualization tool, but we have, we could pull the, we could look at the pull requests from the, the GitHub API and match that to the the person. And then um, because I have the person organization mapping, we could, we could use that. I think we'd have to pull that data from the GitHub API instead of the Augur database because of PII concerns with the University of Missouri. Yeah, I mean, I think I for me, it's sort of, pull, uh, I could certainly grab the pull requests from from the API. It's sort of the hypothesis because your report was predominantly looking at commits and not pull requests, meaning that if the commits are predominantly Elasticsearch, then it could also be if these are all affiliated with not Elasticsearch individuals, they were particularly not leveraging community contribution. Not that it was just insular to their own company, but that they weren't actually that open to community contribution, which is kind of a different story that we haven't necessarily explored. Yeah, absolutely. I can start but pulling I mean, a. <laughs> I, can start, <laughs> I can start pulling a data set together to look at that. In in my copious amounts of spare time. <laughs> I 
I think another interesting thing about this is that um, I wonder if then we can use 8 nod and uh, other data to predict whether projects will start like as they start increasing in this stale or staling process if if then communities are like well we, we don't want to use that anymore um, or if they will or if those companies will end up relicensing i don't know if that could be considered a, pred a predictive variable um, but that's like a whole other project I like that, though, because I think it, it does affect behavior. Like, I know at least from our own perspective, if we're trying to support a project and it's not accepting any of our submissions, then we're not going to support it because they don't want our contribution. Um, but that also means that we're less likely to continue to depend on it in the same way. So it kind of does change the nature of the community and how well you're able to sort of grow, adapt, and expand. But maybe that's, again, maybe that's not the goal. Like, not every project wants to be supported by multiple companies. Um, but I think that, again, this could be more evidence of a potential relicensing activity if they're actively trying to not accept contribution outside of their organization. Yeah, and I think, Dawn, in your work, you said that most of these were people, who, most of the contributors were people who were working for that specific company. And they were the ones who were spending all the time providing contributions. And I think there's that um, tension of, well, other companies aren't contributing. Why should we be giving everything out? Um, so I, I wonder in this, um, if we pull that data with, by matching the PRs to the contributors, if that will tell us more, Sean. What you were saying, Chan, just made made me wonder about um, how how we might think about these these changes over time and how the practices change over time. Um, but now my my thought is gone and I don't have a full recollection of it. So sorry. If it comes back to me, I'll raise my hand again. The lions, Vikings, and bears. <laughs> That's what yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm re I'm recovering from foot surgery, by the way, so my brain is not entirely intact. So, um, fair warning. Sorry about that. Oh, good. No, and I, you know, and I think I think a lot of the data that, that you've pulled, Chan, I think is really really interesting, and I think we should we can also start summarizing it into the because there's a document um, which is linked from the. Um, the the minutes sorry it's not linked from the minutes it's that it's in it's linked from the repository that i linked to in the minutes um that report we could create a whole section in the report that's like you know looking at specific specific metrics so i think it might be good to start start putting start summarizing some of this and putting it in that report doc so that we can we can start thinking about which which of these we want to talk about and which ones we need more data on um because like sophia said the uh, the staling pull requests would be really interesting to look at where those pull requests came from and who made them from which organizations. Yeah, I can start doing that for sure. Um, some of these are a little odd, again, not one-to-one, -one, but that's okay. And so I can start at least putting in like short descriptions of each and then we can start pooling which ones actually mean something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Were there any other slides that you wanted me to, to highlight or any of the other presentations? Um, I, I think the two big things were the that I noticed was the security aspect, the staleness. And then um, I had mentioned that we, um, for the contributor data, if you go down a few more slides, it's contributor behaviors. Um, no, more slides than I thought, sorry. Oh, <laughs> here, here we go. It's starting here. Um, I think, and Don, you mentioned this, that it's just kind of hard to pull in some of this because um, though they, that we just confirmed that even though they don't pull in historical PR data, they do pull in all contributors from the beginning. Um, and so 
this uh, the comparison for this is a little bit more difficult to compare. And this is, it's, it's hard to read the dates because they're all overlapping, but I assume this, co these are commits. And so these are the stuff that probably happened before the fork. Um, so I'm actually not sure. And I wanted to ask maybe Sean and Callie more about what this, what these um, specific visualizations mean. Oh, well, I can right. say that I think Dawn is right that those are commits, okay. that that is the one thing that would span the full record. Yeah, that would make sense with a um, fork. But, and this is the drive through versus, if I'm pretty sure if it's cut off at the bottom, this has a toggle of whether you're looking at drive uh, drive through or repeat contributors. And so we're looking at it from like a, so at the bot, like, so how you, um, propped it, there's like some fields at the bottom of this visualization when you look at it at eight knot and where there's a toggle between whether it is a drive through, if you're looking at drive through contributions or a repeat contributor, um, this is the drive through one I'm assuming because that's the one that's like there by default and it will say it in the title, the title changes as well. So uh, the idea of this is to see what is the like first contribution for somebody who is coming in and only is contributing. I think the default here is four, whatever that that option can be toggable. So what you consider for your this community that you're looking through are somebody who kind of comes in, does a couple contributions and leaves and then being able to see from like the repeat side. OK, what is the behavior that you're seeing from? Um, contributors that end up being a repeat contributor. What is that first contribution? Is that behavior different? Um, that's the like kind of the view here. So yeah, the graph. You, oh yeah, you have it above the graph view is drive through. You can toggle it to repeat to kind of be able to see what is the differences in behavior between contributors who just come in for a couple contributions and um, contributors that stick around. Yeah, and I think to make these meaningful, what we're going to have to do is is just limit it to the time period after after the fork, um, because yeah, all of this is actually Elasticsearch, so it should should kind of map to the. Let's see. Oh, the commits are oh well, it's hard to map it because the commits are in a different color and they're in a different place. Yeah, um, it should map to that pink stuff here. If we parameter an issue, if these can be parameterized with dates. Control. Oh yeah, the, they can be parameter. Uh, I don't know if these can, but if there's things like that, that would be useful to make um like a distinct like oh like having these two different views. If we lo I can like that's a pretty easy configurable thing to make it to where ish like commits is always this specific color for example if you'll run into things like that when you're using eight not please open issues it'd be greatly appreciated because then yeah we're about to have engineering help the time is finally near oh that's so awesome, that's awesome. yeah I think what I'll do is I'll dig into this a little bit more, try and narrow it down to like commit and the dates and see if there's anything interesting um, now that I, I understand it a little bit better. And then if there is something that we can uh, use, maybe I'll put in an issue, but for now, I think we'll just figure out what's what makes this uh, actually usable. Um, and I actually, I have to hop off at this. Um, I only can say for the first half, but thank you all so much for uh, going through that. And let me know if 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 you all look, end up looking at the PowerPoints, if there's anything interesting that you want to dig into, um, I'm happy to meet and talk more about it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so our next meeting is going to be in January, but we'll put this back on the agenda for then. Oh, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Jan. Yeah. This is great. I love this. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, so I'll go back to sharing my screen. Um, so we have uh, we have a couple of other other things that I've been working on. So I um, and I need to I need to actually talk to Kevin Lombard about this a little bit because he and I were chatting at the Linux Foundation Member Summit in Napa a couple of weeks ago, 
and he has some data science students who are interested in, or he thinks could be interested in doing some work within, within the um, chaos data science working group on some of our projects. And one of the things we talked about was that I, um, none of us have spent enough time actually defining these projects so that people could actually pick pieces up and work on it. And for those of us that are experienced and know a lot about open source and know a lot about data, um, we can just sort of dive in the way Chan did with uh, with the project health metrics for the forks and relicensing. But if you're talking about students or if you're talking about trying to divide the work against or across multiple people, that's really hard if you haven't actually uh, done anything to define uh, what these projects might look like. So I've taken a shot at doing that for two projects. So this one, this one used to be called Sudden Archival and I've just made it a bit more, a bit more general. And we don't, it would take us forever to read through all of this in, in the meeting. But what I tried to do was put together a couple of draft research questions or hypotheses, depending on the project, and along with um, a scope for phase one. So, so trying to put together a couple of questions that might be interesting. We can add to those. We can change those that's fine, and try to put together a scope for phase one so that we can get people working on it and we can keep it narrow enough to make it manageable with the idea that then we can expand it. So kind of like what we did with the forks and relicensing. So phase one was organizational affiliation and understanding that piece. And now phase two is starting to look at all of the other project health metrics. So the idea is that any of these projects, we start with phase one, we start with a fairly narrow scope, and define some activities. So, and both of these look kind of similar. There's, um, you know, sort of a project setup phase where you finalize the research questions and scope. Um, you generate a data set of some sort. Um, there's a, a literature review. Now, none of these are intended to be, let me just back up a little bit. The goal is to publish these findings as an LF style research report. So the idea is not to output an academic paper out of this. So someone could certainly take this work and a group of people could turn it into an academic paper, but that's not, not the intent behind the chaos data science uh, working group. So the idea is that we would have some kind of a, some kind of a report. So there'd be some kind of a literature review, but it would be pretty lightweight. So not like, you know, for, for publication, but just, you know, some idea of what's happened in the past and, you know, citing a few kind of key, key sources. Um, there's a metric selection phase, a data collection plan, and then, and then the actual data collection and analysis phase, report writing, and then future, future phases. So, um, you know, for this one, it's, learning more about the characteristics of open source projects that have been archived and what they have in common and whether maybe we could predict projects that could or should be um, archived. And with the hypothesis that most projects are probably archived due to decreasing activity, but it would be interesting to look at what projects didn't have decreasing activity and what those might have in common. So this is the sudden archival case that we, we talked about before. Um, so I'm, a, I'm just going to stop talking for a second. Does this seem like a reasonable way to approach breaking these down? And, and what are your thoughts, starting with Sophia, because she has her hand up. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I think it does, but I don't necessarily know if it'll apply to all projects. Um, so what I was thinking about is similar to like a good first issue tag or something. I think if there are folks that are coming in that are looking for projects that are more well-defined in this way. Um, is that something that we could just tag on the issue list? Um, just to say like, these ones are like, you, for example, have put much more effort into these two particular projects to make them more accessible to folks that are maybe coming in from outside the community. And so just highlighting that in the issue, just saying these are potentially a better first issue um, than something that's less well-defined or maybe just looks a little bit different. It can't necessarily be well-defined in this way. So. I, I generally am supportive of this. I just think knowing that there might be a variety in information in these project issues that ones that have someone has dedicated more time to make more accessible to external or outside community folks, then we should just tag that. 
it's one suggestion. Yeah, yeah. So what I was, what, sorry, I wanted to go to the issue tab because what we have right now is we have the projects as issues and it's one like gigantic project. So my question is, are you proposing that maybe some of these are tar uh, like this one might be tagged as like a good first project to work on? Or are you saying that we should create issues for each project and then tag the individual issues as good first? I think just tagging the project. Like okay. this, I think like this one or just like this one has a well-defined scope or it doesn't necessarily have to be good first issue, but like something that mm -hmm. indicates that this is a better candidate for someone who's less familiar with the project. Yeah. No, that's a really good idea because some of these are, um, you know, like this sort of elephant factor umbrella issue. That's really multiple projects. Like that's going to be really hard for someone to start yeah. with. Classifications is also something that's going to be hard for someone to start with um, because that was created as a project because it's something all of us struggle with. Um, so, so as a, like a, someone new to data science or new to open source wouldn't necessarily find that particularly accessible. Um, and this, this is not intended. So these activities, they kind of looked the same in both of the projects because I deliberately picked two projects that were relatively simple. Um, and so, so these two kind of do sort of look similar where the, the project activities, it's, you know, it's set up data set. Um, in this case, generating a sample because it's a much larger uh, bit of, bit of data, I think. Although we might need a sample with the other one too, I'm not sure. Um, but metric selection, data collection, pan, data collection. Um, so it's all kind of the same things, but I what I tried to do was sort of define it a little bit in the, um, you know, underneath each of these things to help someone provide enough to help someone get started. Um, so Son, this we chatted in in Slack about trying to get the uh, Chaos Africa researchers more involved in in some of these projects. Is this something like is is this type of thing helpful for for your group as well? Whoops, I can't. We can't hear you, Tassan. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. I I was going through the uh, meeting minutes before the meeting in church. Uh, um, I oh, can you hear me now? Uh, okay. yeah, it's Thank a you. bit of a lag. Um. But... So I was going through the minutes before the meeting started, and um, I noticed the work you did here, breaking down the steps that will be involved in the projects. And yeah, I think it will be very helpful. OK, awesome. Um... So what we should what we should probably do is maybe maybe chat more in Slack if and see if there's one of these projects or some of these steps that some of the Chaos Africa researchers are more interested in in tackling. And I also I also do need to talk to Kevin Lombard because he he agreed to help me with um, defining these projects because um, you know he's a he's a professor and we're talking about getting some of his students involved so he has a better sense for for their capabilities and where they are. And uh, I'll be honest, I don't work much with students, so I don't have a, I don't have a lot of uh, context as well. So, um, so I would, I would see these, these two things maybe being refined over the, over the Christmas break. So this is the last data science working group meeting that we have for the year. But the hope is that we can continue to refine these project plans over over the holidays and maybe then uh, come up with a better plan for, for breaking some of these down and, and working on them together in the new year. Um, any questions on that? We only have about 10 more minutes and I wanna give us time for the other, other projects or other agenda items. Okay, uh, data engineering and data science, the software and the data. Well, it's just me and I, I just, Thought it. I think it's important to just ask these questions occasionally in this group because anytime I've ever done data science work or work in that space, there's always been 
the challenge of ensuring that I understand the data that I have, that I can get the data that I need, that I can explain the provenance of that data when I'm writing it up in a paper or a blog post. And, and so somewhere in that spectrum, I think, I think we do a good job of kind of shielding and presenting most of the group from the data engineering piece, um, but it is also always there. And I, I, I think if you're interested in, you know, you want some data, you want to understand better how to get it. Uh, I think folks like you, Don, have experience accessing things directly through the API. I think if that's beyond you, there's also uh, increasingly it's easy to install Augur uh, to pull data down. And, uh, and I know that uh, Callie and uh, Greg Sutcliffe at Red Hat have made some really great progress in the last month making that easier. And, and I don't know. Uh, I'll just take a breath right now and see if Kelly has anything to add to my framing here. Could you, I uh, like caught, I understood the, can you start from the beginning? Or like yeah, the beginning just that. So, so the beginning is effectively that for a lot of things we do in this group, we're kind of, we're protecting in a way the discussion from the engineering of the data part or how do we get the data? What are the techniques behind it? How do we store it? How do we ensure it's valid or whatever? And that we have tools and, and approaches that different members of this group have honed to do that. And we just, we just don't talk about that piece very much, but it is an essential piece that I just uh, wanted to raise as distinct but critical for data scientific work um, with no particular immediate agenda other than I suppose to recognize that when we're talking about the data science part, it's always I think at least helpful to keep in mind that we're aware of how the data that we're using is getting to us, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that's really important because I think I think sometimes we sort of take for granted all of the work that the teams that have put in like Augur and Grimoire Lab into, into actually the, the data engineering piece. And when we collect the data directly from, from GitHub, we need to be a little bit careful about, about how we use it because it's not necessarily been through that rigorous like data cleaning and validation process that some of our tools use. And so I think, I, I think we do need to think about that, that data engineering piece as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's slightly ironic that I've only been able to half pay attention to this conversation because I'm in the deep end of data engineering, whether I like it or not, of trying to get our author uh -huh. instance and everything, like just working on stuff regarding that and just getting the constant reminder about how just every, when you change something, how much it affects literally everything that you do of even just like, okay, now this might change how we run our Jupyter notebooks because our database has moved and now has more security protections than the one that we were using priorly and things like that. Um, almost, I think almost because I am very actively jaded that I'm like, I am not able to focus on the data science side of things because I'm being forced into doing so much data engineering work right now that it's almost nice to have a call in a space that is focused purely on like analyzing. I think it's good to keep in mind. Um, yeah, actively jaded. Like if you talk to me about this in like two months, I'll be like, ha ha, that sucks. But like not have as much of a strong viewpoint of it, but like, Right now, it's nice to have a space, even though I'm not able to like actively participate in the data science work of being like, this is the call for like data science work. And then it could be a discussion of even if as time goes on of whether like the auger and eight not call is more of like a software data instead of it being like a software call being a data engineering call and talking about like if we're focusing on like that is a good call for focusing on eight knots or eight non auger stuff. But usually we only spend like right now it's very heightened, but usually we only use like 10 to 15 minutes on that type of stuff on a basis. And so if people want to talk about like data engineering, how do we get data? How do we I think cleaning is where it starts to get a little bit on the fringe of what is data engineering and what is data science. But when it comes to like, how are we storing the data? How are we keeping it up to date? Those type of conversations, I think, is almost good to like should that call there change a little bit? I think it's kind of by nature, it's software, but are we really talking about, is it really data engineering that we want to have a space to talk about? Cause I do kind of want to keep, I'm biased, especially right now of being like, I would like to keep this pace 
pure data science because of just focusing on analysis never fail to use all 50 minutes of this time just talking about different data science stuff and hearing different people's work and things like that. Yeah, and, and my intention here is only to just raise the awareness or keep it in our minds that the data engineering is a part of it. I certainly don't want to shift the focus of this call, not my intention. Awesome, cool. Um, so we only have three more minutes. So uh, taxonomy crowdsourcing. Um, that's me, and I'll go quickly. Uh, this is a new project idea. I realized I was looking through the current project issues. It could sort of fit under classification. It could fit under something new. Um, I sort of pitched this idea to Don earlier um, at OFA Symposium. Um, but the, the general idea is that as someone who works with a lot of data, I've probably created upwards of 10 to 20 unique taxonomies for any particular analysis project or survey that I've designed. Um, and all of those die in my drive folder <laughs> um, in a way that only I have access to them. And I think that's kind of a shame. And it kind of brings a, another idea that Elizabeth Barron and I had discussed with Chan early on in the event inclusivity discussions, where we were curious whether a community like chaos could also be used as a way to crowdsource different kinds of data. Um, and I thought taxonomies would be a great example to try to do this. I don't really know what the format or like outcome would be, but the goal is just that the more that we collect, the more that they can serve as a reference for others that are doing the same type of thing. Um, and often taxonomies are a reflection of the data source. Like most of the ones I've read in reports have been we looked at all this data from GitHub and these, this is the taxonomy that we have because this is the data that we have and kind of reflects that. And there's always going to be that bias, but as long as it's well documented in something like a data card that will be a subject for another topic because we won't, won't be able to cover it in three minutes. But essentially, if we have a standard way to input this, then it, it could be something that we crowdsource um, and to see where it goes. It's more like it's a way for me to share the work that I've done that's non-sensitive, even though the data is sensitive, taxonomy is not sensitive. Um, so that's something that I could publish. And I pitched it as a FOSM talk. I don't know if they want it or not, um, but just sort of this idea of essentially researchers sharing their taxonomy methods so that we don't have to build them in a vacuum. Um, I think that's sort of the hardest part about writing a comprehensive survey question is seeing a comprehensive survey question and not like silly missing a category because you just didn't think of it. Um, so the idea is that something like this could just help to improve everyone's taxonomies and tagging structures. Um, that's the general idea. It could be a subproject under classifications. It could be a net new thing. Um, I kind of like it under classifications, but I know that would kind of potentially create more muddledness. Um, Sean. Oh, I, I was just, I was thinking that chaos could house these taxonomies. I think a lot of the people, well, I live in this split world, but in the academic world, like if it, if the taxonomy was simply published as an X archive paper, for example, then it would be not only accessible, but also searchable. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the idea more, is basically making data cards for those. So they're, they're more findable. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things that Sophia and I talked about at OFA a couple of weeks ago was putting, you know, creating a place here to put the taxonomies. So we have a place for data sets, we have a place for practitioner guides and publications, and we could create a, basically a, a subfolder for taxonomies and allow people to to contribute them and you know link to the papers that that go with them. And we just need to figure out kind of a standard way of, of doing that. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a proposal for a format. Um, and I think it, it could be a data. I mean, it's kind of a data set in itself. Um, it would just be a crowdsourced data set versus a data set that we upload. Um, as in like people could submit issues to it that would be their own entry. Um, in terms of the actual structure on GitHub, that's where I'm a little fuzzy in terms of like actually making this something consumable versus just like... I mean, again, these can turn into just like a pile of stuff. Um, so I think it's a little bit of an open question, but I, I'd love to bring it as a question to the next meeting. I'll have a proposal um, in place by that point. That's a little bit more formal. So if the team is comfortable with that, I, I'd love to bring that as a potential project to the data science working group. Yeah, that'd be great. We're at time, but thank you for the three minutes. That is now five minutes. And thank you for folks for staying a little longer. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just uh, reminders that we are taking a meeting break. 
So there are almost no chaos meetings. A few people have snuck them in, but almost no meetings between December 9th and January 3rd. So our next meeting is January 14th. There are a couple of open CFPs that I wanted to make people aware of. So you can find those in the in the agenda. So, so have a look. Um, have a look there. Uh, for those of you that are newer to uh, to this meeting, I, I hope you will come back. And as you can see, this is sort of a, you just add your own agenda items. So just like uh, Sean and Sophia did for, for the items that they wanted to talk about. So this isn't this isn't a top down like we decide what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about. Just if you have stuff, just add it to the agenda that you want to talk about, and we're happy happy to chat about it. Okay, awesome. Thanks everybody for staying two minutes late, and uh, yeah, hope to see y'all uh, next time.